in political and military terms, uh, these Indonesian empires were incredibly sophisticated in their organization. So, uh, and th- th- that's my central argument. It's not because of some wonder weapon that they won their wars. It's because they were very, very well uh, organized militarily and politically. Oguz Han, um, what I would suspect is that uh, this is not actually uh, a genuine retelling of uh, Bagatur, uh, you know, Darwa's you know, uh, myth. Hey everyone, CJ here. Boy, do I have a special episode for you. I have managed to nap an interview with Professor Hyun Jin Kim, an expert on Hanuk and Xiongnu history, and also the author of this very excellent book on the Huns, called The Huns. Professor Kim is a classicist who specialized in Herodotus, but he is also a historian who does comparative studies on Western and Eastern history. In fact, he did his doctoral thesis comparing Herodotus, also known as the father of history in the West, with Sima Qian, his Eastern counterpart. He also has a lot of interest in the histories of the steppe and Inner Asia. Thus, with his wide breadth of knowledge, he was able to draw on the various historical traditions to paint a more comprehensive picture on the Huns. So I seized on this opportunity to ask him all the questions everyone had always wanted to ask about the Huns and Xiongnu, including some very controversial ones, such as whether the Xiongnu were Turks or Mongols. Oh yeah. I can hear the sound of typing on the comment section already. Anyway, let's not waste any time and get right into the first question. Were the Xiongnu and the Huns one and the same? Well, um, the Xiongnu are the Huns and are not the Huns at the same time. So, uh, which is to say, uh, the I think uh, what you the latter part of what you said is uh, clearer to what the reality, I suppose, and that is that. Uh, The Huns of Europe and the Huns of Central Asia, of course, they are the white Huns who conquer Central Asia and then move on to conquer Iran and then parts of India. Um, And then, of course, there is the the, the more famous uh, European Huns, right, Mm -hmm. who who became notorious because of uh, the conquest of uh, much of continental Europe and their wars against the Roman Empire. Uh, These are Attila's Huns, right? Uh, uh, Now, both these groups have the name Hun. And um, if you look back on well, the Xiongnu, of course, is the name uh, by which we call the, the Huns of the East. Xiongnu, of course, is the modern Mandarin pronunciation of those glyphs. Whereas in Old Chinese, in Early Middle Chinese, they were called Hunnu. Uh, so it is the same name. Right? And uh, there is a lot of evidence that has come to light recently, uh, primarily from uh, Dunhua, where records which date back to the 4th century AD uh, clearly states that uh, the southern Xiongnu who sacked Luoyang in the early part of the 4th century, uh, they are clearly called Huns. Uh, contemporaries call the Xiongnu Huns, but of course those glyphs, because of uh, the changes in Chinese pronunciation, uh, are now called Xiongnu. So the, the original guess was made by De Guinia, who was a Jesuit priest who worked in Qing China. He made the guess that uh, the names are quite similar or the same, and that therefore these two groups are identical. Now, the, the, the first part of his hypothesis was correct. Yes, the name is identical, but the, the second part is wrong in the sense that uh, there is growing uh, 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 evidence, genetic evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, which is showing that uh, some of the elite of the, the European Huns, for example, the people who settled in Hungary, uh, they do have DNA that go back to uh, the Eastern steppes. That is true. Right, uh, that is undeniable. Uh, so, and if you look at the the political system of the European Huns and their culture, uh, the the resemblances and similarities are so strong that uh, it is not uh, feasible to deny the proposition that there must be some kind of uh, genetic links between uh, the European uh, Huns, their ruling class, that is, and uh, uh, the original territory of the uh, the the Xiongnu. So that, that's pretty clear. But uh, whether the, the, uh, the European Huns were descended from the original Xiongnu, you know, Chanyu's, uh, who knows? <laughs> that's anybody's guess. Uh, but uh, what is important, I guess, is that all of these peoples who conquered in, in the West, in the Western half of Eurasia, the White Huns and uh, the European Huns, uh, they all claimed the imperial legacy of the Huns in the East. Right? So for them, that was a very important thing. They held on to that uh, state name. And of course, the name Hun, as I emphasize in my book, is not actually a, an ethnic name, 
right. or a tribal name or a or a you know a racial you know category it's a, it is a state name it is the name that was adopted maybe it was originally a tribal name who knows but uh, uh, by the time that it was all over it was associated with imperial tradition of the steppes so like the name rome or roman in uh, in western eurasia um, and of course a lot of people joined it i mean the original shungnu empire in east asia was very very hybrid too um, and i think one of the questions that you gave me yeah. was you know, what was the the language of the the shungnu ruling right. uh, group right. nobody knows <laughs> right. it's impossible to figure that out uh, and but uh, what we do know for certain is that uh, the shungnu empire possessed people who spoke uh, turkic languages mm-hmm. anisean languages mongolic languages indo european languages and among them tokarian and iranian uh, and also even some chinese speaking peoples right they were defectors from china who uh, were absorbed into the shungnu empire as well so this is an empire that we are talking about and uh, uh, which language did they speak well we know that the jie um a uh, tribe that uh, formed a part of the empire later presumably spoke a yenisean language i mean the linguistic uh, you know a uh, data that we do have which is very meager right? which is very small but uh, that does lead us to suspect that uh, that particular group uh, spoke a yenisean language which only survives amongst the kets in central siberia but uh, what did the the other shungnu the main shungnu confederation the leadership uh, what language did they speak i would say given the geography and uh, the uh, uh, the the current state of scholarship on the original location of these language groups uh, the the ordos region which is where the uh, the shungnu originated from that region ha- has been identified with the uh, turkic language speakers as the sort of the, the original urheimat to use the the german term uh, so I think, uh, and if you look at a lot of Shungnu names and titles, uh, yes, some have made the suggestion that uh, these titles are either Indo-European or uh, Yenisean, but uh, I think a stronger case probably could be made of uh, Turkic origin, mm-hmm. possibly, but that is very uncertain. And uh, it is clear that uh, even the elite was very uh, polyglot. They spoke a lot of languages. And um, and that the same thing happens, of course, in the West, right? So once they... Uh, conquer in Europe uh, the composition of the population changes obviously so the the eastern tribes and eastern peoples are coming in but they're mixing with Iranians uh, firstly and then with uh, the Goths uh, the Germanic tribes uh, with Slavs with Baltic peoples with uh, Finno-Ugric peoples uh, Ital- you know sort of Roman speaking peoples and so uh, at uh, Attila's court uh, there is a a scene where uh, well there is a record in Priscus who is the the Roman ambassador who visited the Hunnic court he's left a record of his experience and in that report it says that uh, uh, there was a, uh, a jouster a, a royal fool or clown <laughs> by the name of Zerkon oh. and uh, he uh, mingles together gothic hunnic presumably that means turkic Mm-hmm. and uh, and latin all together he jumbles the the three languages together and that provokes laughter uh, amongst the uh, the assembled aristocrats uh, in the banquet hall so which implies that they understand all three right so um so this is a, this is not a a racial group it's it's, mm-hmm. a, it's it never was a racial group it's a, it's an imperial state uh, now mm-hmm. there may have been a principal language who knows uh, mm-hmm. uh, but um The best guess at the moment is that probably it's either Yenisean or Turkic uh, that the original group spoke uh, either of those two languages mm-hmm. um or both right. uh, but um it doesn't seem plausible that uh, the original language was Mongolic or mm-hmm. uh, Indo-European mm-hmm. uh, but um who knows we might be proven wrong right, right, yeah, okay. right? because there is actually a very small it's very small but there is some evidence of possible Shungnu writing as well uh, from mongolia uh it's it's debated whether it constitutes writing or not but uh, if th- that proves to be true that uh, it is writing then um, and if somebody deciphers it at some point then we we might finally figure out uh, what the sort of the official language was but uh, until then of course uh, i mean there's so much work that that is being done on the subject right now that uh, uh, i mean we have to rewrite things every five years and uh Yeah, that's that's the exciting bit, I suppose. 
Now here comes the second question. Let's see if the professor can settle once and for all the question whether the Xiongnu were Turkic or Mongol. I think it's a fruitless debate because uh, the Xiongnu obviously didn't care <laughs> what language you spoke. In fact, the Chinese defectors, high-level Chinese defectors who went over to the Xiongnu, they were even made kings. Uh, Yi Ling, you know that uh, Li Ling, rather, it's uh, yeah, the, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. the commander who's, uh, who surrendered to the, uh, uh, the Xiongnu, and because of that, Sima Chen, of course, got castrated, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> For right. For defending that general. Yeah. Well, he uh, was reputed to have become a king amongst mm. the some of the Dingling, anyway, mm, right. and uh, and he was appointed as such by the um, by the Xiongnu um, Chan Yu, the emperor. Mm. And uh, uh, and later, of course, the Tang Dynasty, which claimed descent from Li Ling as well, uh, mm -hmm. uh, claimed kinship with the the, the Kagans of the Kyrgyz. Right? So the Kyrgyz are the descendants of the Dingling, or yeah. claimed to be anyway. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Tang Dynasty chronicles record that uh, some of the Kyrgyz have black hair and blue black eyes. So, so these must be the descendants of Li Ling. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and the others have a bizarre appearance. They have red hair and blue or green eyes. And so they must be these other, you know, sort of original inhabitants. Uh, the Xiongnu didn't care who, what the ethnic background of the individual was, as long as he or she was useful. If, if that person had the particular skills or the particular assets that uh, they, they liked, then they were just simply in integrated into uh, the system. So uh, the, the whole debate of, about whether you know, the Xiongnu were Turkic or Mongolic, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, I suppose what they're referring to is that so before uh, Modu Chanyu, or uh, well, his name is not actually Modu. It's again, you know, the the original uh, old Chinese uh, pronunciation was something close to Baktur, uh, so that's right. Bahadur or Bagatur, which is of course uh, right. because the M used to be a B, right? So. Right. Um, um, and uh, the N, when uh, so the Chinese uh, transcription has N, it's usually an R. It represents an R because uh, it was difficult to represent R uh, with the Chinese glyphs. So it's Baktur or Bahadur, which later on becomes the, the Turko Mongol word for hero. Right? So, okay. And um, well, he, uh, before he unified the steppes, um, there was another, uh, of course, uh, powerful nomadic confederation or steppe confederation called the Donghu. Uh, and um, they were I they were probably pr primarily Mongolic, uh, but with some uh, Tunguzic elements in, in, in them as well. Um, and this group, of course, was conquered by uh, Modu Chanyu yeah. or Bahadur uh, Chanyu. Again, Chanyu, that's, an, that's a modern reading. Uh, right. the, the old Chinese reading sounds something more like uh, uh, Daruga or Dargwa, Dargwa or something like that which probably is related to the later Turkic title Darkan or something like okay. that, right? So, but, um, well, you know, this is all speculation, of course, but uh, then mm -hmm. that's what some people claim. Right. Um, anyways, which means that uh, if the, the Donghu was primarily Mongolic, mm -hmm. then uh, if I suppose a case could be made that uh, given the geography, the Xiongnu who were in between the, the Mongolic peoples to mm -hmm. the east and the Indo-European Yueji to, to the west, they must have been uh, either Turkic speaking or Yeniseyan speaking. So, you know, that's where I suppose the, the whole sort of uh, uh, debate uh, comes from. But uh, for those who are aware of this anyway, uh, uh, but um, but in the end, pointless. <laughs> right. They were both Xiongnu when the Xiongnu ruled them. And of course, later, many of these uh, original Xiongnu become absorbed into the Xianbei. Right. And uh, the Xianbei were pri primarily Mongolic, but uh, they weren't just Mongolic speakers. They had other peoples as well who, who joined them. So mm -hmm. it depends on which group is ruling you and your name changes. Right? Yeah. So, um, and the Xianbei, again, you know, uh, that's the, the modern pronunciation. The, the old Chinese is Serbi. Right? Serbi. So, so, right. And probably that's the origin of the name Siberia. Right? So that's where it comes from, presumably. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so interesting stuff, but uh, yeah. pointless, <laughs> pointless disagreement, I would say. So this information raises another question. Did the ancient people who were ruled by the Xiongnu or Xianbei elites also consider themselves as part of the same people? Uh, I think the ethnic element is very weak. 
right? right. Uh, I mean, there, there is distinction between languages, obviously. So right. people will recognize that these people speak a different language from us. Mm -hmm. But that is not a criteria for uh, uh, differentiation in the sense that mm -hmm. uh, uh, that doesn't prevent you from intermarrying with these people or right. forming a common uh, sort of political group with them. Mm -hmm. And it's really the ruling elite that determines what the name is, right? So uh, the names such as Mongol, Tatar, um, uh, Shungnu, uh, Shenbei, th these are all names that were attributed, that were associated with elite lineages, right? So these are elite political lineages mm -hmm. and whichever of them attained power, they, uh, the, the other groups that were subdued by them or joined them, then just adopted that name. So when the Mongols conquered the whole of Eurasia, of course, many, many different people just become Mongol. But in mm -hmm. fact, uh, originally they were called Tatars and Kereid and Merkit and so on and so forth. But all these identities become submerged and uh, mm -hmm. they just uh, adopt the same name, uh, Mongol. But um, so we tend to see everything because the 19th century when uh, the scholarship was first conceived, right. uh, uh, historical scholarship in the Western tradition was uh, was conceived um, mm -hmm. um, in its modern form. Uh, that was a time of nationalism and racial theories. And as a consequence, so when they uh, uh, approached uh, inter-Asian history, they thought uh, in European terms and in racial terms. And so they identified these words with race or racial groups and ethnic groups. And therein lies the flaw, because in the steppes, uh, and in Inner Asia, if you've visited Kazakhstan or <laughs> Mongolia or any of these places, uh, ethnic uh, differentiation the, or in the sort of the, you know, the Western sort of racial sense, uh, they, they just don't make any sense uh, in that okay. area. Mm -hmm. That is not how uh, uh, people uh, categorize themselves. And mm -hmm. so, and in many ways, I hate to hesitate to use the term because it can uh, cause confusion, but this was a feudal society or a quasi-feudal society in the right. sense that uh, uh, they are not tribes. I wouldn't say they are even tribes. They are uh, military uh, uh, organizations that uh, follow certain elite lineages. So, we do, for example, who are the Kerates or the, who are the Naimans and who are the, uh, the Jalayirs? Uh, these are, are classified as tribal names, but really they are uh, names of uh, the, the, the feudal lords who have been assigned their particular territory and people to govern, right? So these are not ethnic groups or tribal groups as such. They're actually military uh, organizations, which of course begin with the Shunda, right? So that's uh, the, what that's what the, uh, the, uh, the Huns of the East actually achieved, uh, this uh, level of feudalization. They distributed fiefs uh, to their uh, princes and uh, vassals. And so via the system, what happened was is that uh, uh, this isn't a group of, you know, different different sort of ethnic tribes, sort of, you know, fighting with each other. It's a case of an empire forming and then fragmenting, as they usually do. And then, uh, if there is a particularly charismatic military leader that emerges to uh, to unite this territory back together again, then of course those military units just uh, simply fall back into line. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of tribes morphing into. Um, uh, into a sort of a nation state or whatever it's it's the other way around so it's a, it's these uh, sort of military units of a unif unified huh? empire breaking down into subunits and then if unification reunification fails then those uh, military units take on the the characteristic of a tribe or what we would call a tribe so it's it's the reverse process <laughs> okay um, so in uh, in uh, in inner asia uh, things are different Right. So it's uh, the, the sort of the, the Marxist model of uh, uh, natural progress from hunter gatherers to what uh, uh, agriculturalists and then to city city dwellers and, and so on. It just doesn't work in the steps because um, various lifestyles and uh, uh, methods of uh, sustenance coexist with each other and people transition from one mode to the other very easily in this space. Uh, so an urban, urban dweller could uh, just become a pastoralist and then revert back to urban dwelling. And uh, somebody who was a pastoralist could uh, you know, then suddenly become an agriculturalist if he settled in the cities and so on and so forth. And in the same geographical space, all of this was possible because of the geography and the terrain. Uh, so um, very, very complex societies uh, existed in, in Eurasia. And yet uh, we tend to think of them as just uh, you know, horse riding nomads who <laughs> just roam aimlessly uh, because of course of the 
uh, the very prejudiced and um, and uh, ideological uh, portrayals mm. of the left to us mm. by uh, both uh, Greco-Roman historians mm. and uh, and of course yeah. uh, to a certain yeah. extent by Chinese historians as well. Yeah. Sima Chen, of course, he's a great historian, but uh, mm. he's not above you know <laughs> spreading mm. proper, a little bit of a little bit of propaganda. Yeah. And so mm. his representation of the Shumnu is brilliant, but uh, it is. Uh, highly misleading in various places and he he knows it right because uh, right after he has said at the beginning that oh the shungnu have no towns and then later towards the end of his uh the shungnu the, you know, the, the chapter he mentions shungnu towns so in the same breath he contradicts himself uh, because he knows of course that uh, this is uh, he, he's referring to a particular group within the shungnu Right. Uh, who he perceived to be the, the ruling class, who mm-hmm. were primarily pastoralists. Right. And then he extrapolates from that mm-hmm. and he uses that to draw the maximum level of contrast between this nomadic world mm-hmm. and the sedentary world of uh, the Han Empire. And, right. uh, uh, he has a political motive for doing this uh, because he wants to uh, reject uh, the, the military policies of uh, Han Wudi, right, uh, the emperor. Yep, right. He's saying that uh, the Xiongnu belong to a different category which, uh, according to uh, the old uh, way of uh, viewing things, uh, should not become part of the empire at all, right? These people should be should remain outside, and therefore it's useless to try to conquer them. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, passage where Sima Chen says that uh, Gao Gong Danbo, Danbao, who was the uh, the ancestor of the the Zhou kings, <clears throat> is supposed to have uh, just you know sort of left the nomads be. Right, so the, the the ancestors of the nomads just be and did not fight them and just uh, avoided them, and they submitted of their own of, of their own accord and didn't <laughs> cause trouble. <laughs> right, so and that is clearly contrasted with uh, the, the the wasteful military policies or so-called wasteful military <laughs> policies of Han Budi, right, who's wasting treasure and yeah. blood on this useless exercise. Right, so um, <laughs> yeah, Sima Chen, great historian, but um, he's uh, he's not above a, a bit of bias. <laughs> Sima Qian was one of the world's greatest historians. He may have meticulously recorded history, but I wondered whether it is possible that his sources provided him with inaccurate information, since it was likely that he only acquired his information secondhand. Definitely secondhand. Uh, right. There were uh, a lot of Xiongnu prisoners who, mm-hmm. who settled in Chang'an at the time. Mm-hmm. So um, there is, of course, the famous case of Jin Mi Di, right? Well, yeah. Uh, Kim Il Jie, right? Uh, mm. Who uh, who settled? Uh, he who was a he was a Shungnu prince, a minor princeling. He was captured, and um, he was reduced to a slave in the the royal stables. And mm. then, of course, uh, Han Wudi uh, sort of recognizes him and thinks that he's a he's an impressive looking bloke. <laughs> so right. And right. later, of course, he he uh, prevents an assassination attempt on the emperor. And for that, of course, he's uh, he's raised very high. And he, in fact, uh, he is one of the three regents of the next emperor, um, uh, who was uh, sort of commissioned by the, the emperor himself uh, on his mm-hmm. deathbed. So he rises very high. And in fact, he would have been the principal regent mm-hmm. if he hadn't refused to become the principal regent. He actually mm-hmm. turned down the emperor's request saying that I'm a Xiongnu prince, I'm a Han prince, and uh, uh, the Chinese will not you know, obey me right? So if I were to become the, the principal regent. Um, so um, now these people were around, and of course, uh, th- th- that would mean that uh, Xiong- tales about uh, the, how the, the Xiongnu Empire came into being would have been in circulation. Right. But if you look carefully at uh, Sima Chen's record of, uh, uh, you know, Bagatur, uh, you know, uh, Darwa or you know, Modu Chanyu, uh, it presents him in the worst possible light. Yes, he's a he's an impressive figure, mm-hmm. but he is cast in a way that uh, makes him uh, completely unacceptable to the Chinese. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, he is the opposite of what a uh, filially pious uh, Confucian ruler should be. He kills his own father, right? So, so that's the worst thing that you can possibly do. Now, Sima Chen never makes things up, right? To his credit, right? he, he, he does have something here. But he's probably deliberately overlooking something that uh, might sort of explain why this is, is, this is happening. Even in steppe societies, a parasite was not accepted as king. Uh, that was something that you couldn't do. Uh, this was considered to be completely outrageous. You cannot kill your own father to become king. That rarely ever happens uh, in, in, in the annals of step history. You can kill your brothers. That happens all the time. <laughs> right. but you can't kill your dad or your mom. Right? Yeah, right. That's just 
beyond despicable. So if if uh, Modu Chanyu had been a parasite, uh, he it, he it would have been very difficult for him to you know be accepted as ruler by even his own people, right. uh, let alone um, everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, which leads me to suspect that maybe what is happening is the the system of leverage, right? So that is the system by which if an older brother dies then the younger brother or the nearest cousin marries his widow mm -hmm. so in other words technically speaking toman who is the uh, the so-called father that uh, modu assassinates yeah. or kills uh, in battle uh, he is technically the father of modu mm -hmm. because he's the stepfather mm -hmm. uh, but he might not be the biological father right so um which, which is strange, though, which I think makes perfect sense because uh, the king mm -hmm. exiles Modu uh, to the Yueji and uh -huh. then deliberately attacks the Yueji so that the Yueji would be angered and would kill him right? yeah. <laughs> so that he can have his other son succeed yeah. him. Mm -hmm. Now, um, again, if you look at all the annals of steppe history, this never happens right? because succession to the throne uh, on the, in the Xiongnu is not like uh, succession in, um, say, yeah. On China, where yeah. uh, the eldest son usually g gets the throne, it's mm -hmm. uh, whoever has the greatest support gets the the throne. So you mm -hmm. don't necessarily even have to kill the kill somebody off yeah. uh, be be before this happens. So the bloodletting, right? The, the bloodletting and the the civil wars happen after the death of a particular sovereign. It never happens before. It mm -hmm. rarely ever happens before uh, the death of, of a ruler. So. Um, and of course, they have a system for doing this, right? It doesn't necessarily even have to go to a bloodshed. They have uh, assemblies where aristocrats gather and uh, whoever has the greatest support just becomes king. And it doesn't have to be the eldest son. It can be any son or any cousin, in fact. So just because Modu was the first son of, uh, say, Toman, that does not guarantee that he'll be king. Far from it. If Toman had other brothers or cousins who were older than uh, uh, Modu, they certainly would have been, right? So many of them. Yeah then uh, Modu would not have been king, right? So the fact that uh, he was set up for elimination kind of suggests that he must have been the the, uh, uh, the heir of some other lineage rather than Toman's own lineage. Mm -hmm. So technically speaking, it's, it's, it's not falsehood that he is the, <laughs> the son of Toman because technically speaking, he is. But uh, the, all of the, the background information that is provided would suggest that uh, he's not actually a biological son. He's actually just a... Either an adopted son or mm -hmm. uh, you know a stepson, so uh, that uh, makes the the assassination all the more uh, understandable and why there is this war between the two groups. Um, and of course, uh, he is uh, sort of uh, cast as this Machiavellian, almost Stalin-like figure, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, he does inspire enormous loyalty, right? And later, of course, he is able to pass on his throne directly to his son, and. Uh, something unheard of in the steps happen yeah. after Modu. Uh, generation after generation, for about three generations, uh, the, the son of, of the father succeeds to the throne. Yeah. Uh, instead of it going to collateral succession, which is the usual way it happens, right? Yeah. A brother succeeding yeah. a brother, or a yeah. brother being, a king being succeeded, succeeded by his eldest cousin, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, in the Shungnu system, everything is, everybody respects Bhavatur, uh, Mm -hmm. so much that um, his line is uh, is preserved until the great civil wars that break out right. during the war against Han China, which was, of course, bad luck for the Huns, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that uh, it just had to sort of break apart at, at that very moment. But um, uh, so um, he is being presented as the sort of the antithesis of the the noble sort of ruler of the Huaxia, right? So, mm -hmm. so he has to, he's yeah. the sort of the evil scapegoat. Right. And... Uh, of course, not all of it is false, right? He must have been a ruthless ruler to be able to create an empire. Any creator of an empire uh, is ruthless. So just look at Liu Bang himself. All right, the, yeah. the yeah. Han dynasty. Okay. So, but uh, um, Sima Chen, again, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is developing an image of, of the, the particular person, not by falsifying uh, the details that he has, but uh, uh, positioning them in such a way that you'd be left with a certain impression. Right, and right. Uh, that's what he successfully does. Mm -hmm. right? so, um, but then, you know, that's that's the beauty of Sima Chen, right? He's he's a, he's a dramatist. If you if you've read through the entire work, uh, yeah. he truly is a storyteller of the first order, yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. should ring alarm bells, right? Because <laughs> yeah. if it's entertaining, there is a problem there because yeah. there is a deliberate uh, narrative yeah. that is being produced, mm -hmm. right. which is, I think, missed by uh, many uh, East Asian historians, right? Mm -hmm. They 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 haven't. Uh, 
they regard uh, any kind of record to be completely you know, the yeah. accurate objective truth when in fact uh, yeah. uh, no no narrative or, or mm-hmm. even yeah. a chronicle is actually objective it's, <laughs> yeah, it's that's tailored true. By the way, just to let you know, the Grand Assemblies held by the Hans and Xiongnu to elect their leader would later be called Kurultai by the Mongols. The, uh, the Xiongnu also had their uh, sort of assemblies, aristocratic assemblies, and they would gather at the sacred spots, right? so which of course later the Han, uh, mm. uh, when they are on, on, a, on a winning streak, penetrate right up yeah. to these places uh, <laughs> yeah. to cause havoc. Mm. Um, but um, all of the later imperial traditions that you find in the the Gök Turk, you know, the Turkish Khaganates, and uh, in the later Mongol Empire, they were started by the Shunmen. So mm-hmm. um, this is this is very old, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, probably the Scythians in the Western steppes had uh, system uh, systems in place which were very very similar as well. Uh, so uh, the, the sort of the what I call the quasi feudal system of governance that. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, dominated these societies mm. they are thousands of years old and uh, i don't think it's an accident that uh, joe china also has a very similar system right of you know uh, distributing fiefs uh, to family members so that it's very similar to step practices and of course the joe dynasty itself yeah. uh, was supposedly from uh, from the step right uh, uh, or had some kind of uh, wrong origins according to yep. uh, yes. at least the confucian literature that survived mm. so, so uh, something was happening in the entire region. It's not just one place. The entire region was undergoing a political uh, transformation, and uh, that was so effective. Well, it worked pretty well, and it just was preserved for posterity. So, could there be an older culture from which all these step cultures were derived from? I would say so, but um, um, nobody really knows because, of course, we don't have any records back then. But there is this, uh, I mean, I'm working on this right now, actually. There is a very strange archaeological phenomenon. Uh, It's called the the Seymour Turbino phenomenon, whereby a group of people from what is now Western Mongolia, or thereabouts, thereabouts, suddenly explosively expand at around about uh, 2000 BC. And... uh, and uh, their artifacts, in just a matter of a couple of generations, reach the Baltic Sea in the West. Oh, wow. And some of their artifacts are found in central Thailand in the South. Oh, right? So yeah. they're, they're really going, you know, uh, <laughs> this is Mongol-like, you know, sort of uh, expansion. Right. Right. Um, now, whether that constitutes military conquest or just some kind of, um, you know, haphazard, you know, a migration of people's left, right and center, uh, nobody really knows. But... Um, uh, this is something that deserves research, but of course, as of now, we have no way of knowing, right? So we are completely dependent on archaeology for this. But uh, without the help of written sources, of course, we cannot know what sort of political system they practice. But uh, uh, what is known is, is that they're using the same type of bronze weapons uh, produced with the same kind of technology. And the same technology is found in the, the shores of the Baltic Sea and in central Thailand. So that, that's a huge geographical space to be covering. Yeah. And you're made to, you're left wondering, how is this even possible <laughs> if these people have no political organization whatsoever? Right? They must have had some kind, something. And um, and then, of course, we've got this weird phenomenon of uh, Scythians in the West mm. and uh, the Huns and the Chinese in the East, all kind of practicing similar modes of governance. Uh, that mm-hmm. are not entirely the same, obviously, but uh, right. having similar ideas. And also the color symbolism, right? Um, okay. Which yeah. you find in China. East meaning East is blue. Uh, you know, yeah. black is north, uh, red right. is south, mm-hmm. yellow is center, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, white is west. Mm-hmm. That is found in China, that is also found in uh, steppe cultures, mm-hmm. and also in the west as well. So amongst mm-hmm. uh, steppe peoples in particular. So right. there must have been some kind of a common uh, cultural, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, layer, right. uh, which um, which allowed for later sort of cultures to build on and to, to, to develop further. Mm-hmm. But um, the next question is about Oghuz Khan, a legendary Khan and the ancestor of the Oghuz Turkic people, who eventually became the Ottomans. Previous scholars link his legend to the ancient Xiongnu leader, Modu Shanyu, or Bagatur, and claim that it was derived from the latter. But Professor Kim has this to say. Ah uh, yes, this is yeah. incredibly problematic, right, the oh, story right. of Oghuz Khan. Uh, he's the yeah. sort of the... Uh, eponymous ancestor of the Oghuz Turks. The, the name mm. gives it away. Right? Yeah. So, so it's it's a particular rendition of uh, of a particular widespread myth, mm-hmm. um, but it is a particular Oghuz version. 
an mm. Islamized version too. Right? So, right. so this is very specific to the Oghuz Turks who settled in Central Asia and then moved on further west mm. and of right. course later ended up in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Oghuz Han um, is uh, now I'm not a I'm not an expert on you know, the, the particular text. So what I say here is purely my opinion on on uh, on that particular text and uh, that legend. But uh, what uh, what I would suspect is that uh, this is not actually uh, a genuine retelling of uh, Bagatur, uh, you know, Darwa's you know, uh, myth or legend. It's a sort of a uh, you know a syncretic melange mixture of some aspects that go back to uh, the story of uh, Modu, uh, but also uh, elements of it uh, are strongly influenced by uh, what happened under the Karakhanids. Right? So the, the Karakhanids uh, were uh, Turks who, the first Turks to convert to Islam. And uh, they had a powerful impact on, of course, the Oghuz, who later adopted Islam. Um, and the, the Karahanids, uh, the first Karahanid Khan to convert to Islam, was issued a fatwa by the, the Muslim authorities to assassinate his father, who was uh, still a pagan. So, um, Oghuz Khan, of course, uh, kills his father there, right? Uh, uh, and I suspect that, uh, and of course, there is a record of you know him having a Chinese wife, yeah. and uh, you know uh, the, the so the Chinese wife and son is sort of dispensed with, and it's uh, Modu who uh, or Oghuz who prevails right um, after the assassination. But of course, uh, when uh, the uh, the Muslim Turks referred to China, they weren't actually referring to what we call what we would call China, or sort of uh, the Zhongnu and that area. Yeah. What they're referring to is the Tarim Basin. Right, so mm -hmm. that's Karahanid territory, mm -hmm. and so um, presumably the uh, what uh, this legend is referring to is not the, because of course in the original tale of Sima Chen there is no tale, no talk of a Chinese princess, right? So yeah. that's later. That's much much later. Um, so uh, what is probably happening here is is that uh, uh, the Karahanids. Uh, who had converted were the Western Karahanids, right? So the Western part of the you know, Karahanid state, and they were forcibly converting the Eastern half uh, to Islam, who were considered to be living in China because, of course, the Tarim Basin was regarded to be uh, a part of uh, the, well, it was, it was conquered by Han China. So there was considered to be a China uh, by the Muslims to the East, uh, to the West. And so uh, I've got a feeling that the, the legend of Oghuz is actually uh, the legend of this Karahanid Khan rather than that of Modu. But there are there is something that is coming down from uh, that as well. But by this stage, uh, I mean, Modu lived in the what the third century BC. Mm -hmm. And this legend uh, was in circulation after probably the 10th century AD. Right. So we're talking about 1,300 years. So, so uh, I don't think social memory would have preserved anything that mm -hmm. really went back as far as, um, mm -hmm. as Modu Chanyu. But... Uh, the the uh, the legend associated with the Islamization of the Karahanids and the Turks in Central Asia. This was very recent, uh, right. or a, a couple of centuries uh, uh, right. ago. So uh, that is probably where the the legend of Oghuz Han comes from, and not uh, Modu Chanyu. Although, of course, there are scholars who argue that uh, yeah. this this goes back to Sima Chen. But right. how on earth would Muslim Turks have read Sima Chen? Right? So that's. Uh, uh, I don't think that's uh, plausible, but uh, you know, it's uh, we can argue about that. Yeah. But could it be possible that Modu Sanyu's narrative had became a template for various step culture to base their leaders on, and it also influenced Ogus Khan's legend? Yes, possibly, possibly. But uh, as I said, you know, parasite or killing of the parent mm. is not considered to be a noble deed amongst uh, amongst any people in Central Asia. So. Um, uh, it needs some kind of a religious justification, right? right? Uh, and uh, in the history of Sima Chen, there is no justification. It's just mm -hmm. a straight case of, you know, just uh, murder, right? So of mm -hmm. course, the, the father tries to kill the son first, but yes. still. Right. Um, whereas in the case of Oghuz Han, uh, Oghuz Han and the, the Karahanid prototype, um, there is a religious justification because the father refused to convert to Islam. Right. And this is an Islamized tale of the origin of the Oghuz. So mm -hmm. the Karahanids obviously come first, and then the Oghuz mm -hmm. uh, take over. 
And so the Oguz were uh, using Karahanid prototypes and uh, Karahanid conventions uh, once they had converted to Islam. And so that makes me think that uh, probably the prototype of the story is a story that relates to the Karahanids mm -hmm. rather than uh, to Modu. Uh, right. But um, yeah, it's as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's very debatable. Uh, but um, uh, I think that's probably more likely. I think uh, you did a, a video on Aladdin, right? At some point. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, you did mention there, of course, uh, a very interesting theory that, uh, uh, yes, so Aladdin is probably refers to somebody in Central Asia. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's highly plausible, actually. Uh, I was very impressed by that, uh, by your suggestion there. And uh, I would say that it's probably something similar in this case as well. It's, right, yeah. it's a, what's happening in Central Asia mm -hmm. uh, in an Islamized context right. rather than uh, in Mongolia. Continuing on with mythologies, I asked about the prevalence of the theme of founding figures of various civilizations having been raised by wolves and crows. Is there a link between Rome's Romulus and Remus and other steppe cultures' founding figures? Absolutely. And in fact, there is, a, there is an even older prototype which is preserved in Herodotus. Herodotus tells you the story of the, the birth and uh, 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 saving of uh, Cyrus the Great, right? mm -hmm. the founder of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Or mm -hmm. well, Darius was an Achaemenid, probably. <laughs> Cyrus wasn't an Achaemenid, but uh, that's another story altogether. Anyway, uh, Cyrus supposedly was exposed at birth mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, reared by a she-wolf. Mm -hmm. Now Herodotus says that uh, oh that's just a tall just a tall tale told by people and uh, he was just raised by a nurse whose name was bitch right and, and that's why right. this, this woman had had a very peculiar peculiar name and she was called bitch <laughs> and that's why a legend then suddenly sort of uh, developed which suggested that Cyrus was reared by an actual she wolf but obviously the original story that Herodotus is referring to is this uh, you know story coming from Inner Asia from the steppes mm -hmm. of hero figures. Uh, being reared by a she-wolf and uh, right. the, the tribe or the people being associated with the wolf totem right? so, and of course birds too. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the Wusun version of that mm -hmm. and uh, and later the, the, the Gokturk version of that and uh, the, the Roman version of that, they all come from uh, the same source presumably because they're all very similar. And there is of course the, the Korean version too, <laughs> the, the right. legend of Dongmyeong, right? So mm -hmm. they, they are all coming from the same source mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they emanate from somewhere in Inner Asia. And mm -hmm. of course, the Indo-Europeans, uh, the Indo-European languages are native to Central Asia too, before they moved out uh, right. into Europe, and into India and Iran. So uh, this, is a, this is a legend which uh, emanates from this, entire, from this region and it's shared by a broad, you know, sort of section of peoples and languages, language groups uh, that uh, derive from Inner Asia. Um, so I would say there is a connection, but it's a very, very old one. In the accounts of various civilizations, warring and raiding were considered to be part of the Xiongnu and Hansa's nature. But I find this quite hard to believe. In all societies, killing and robbing are considered a sin. But then, how did they justify all their violent activities? Yes, this is the thing, right? Uh, because we are almost completely dependent on uh, you know, the, the sources of the enemy. <laughs> yeah. But we don't have a Xiongnu history right. of the Xiongnu. Han, you know, wars or anything like that. So, um, the, the, the history of these peoples is strictly told from the, the point of view of their enemies. And you can imagine how that would go down. Right? So, uh, they're made to appear as the unjust party. They're constantly raiding for no reason. They're constantly breaking treaties. And uh, constantly, you know, uh, they have no, they break faith all the time. Right? So, these people cannot be trusted. They're compared to, compared to wolves and jackals. Um, uh, they're like it to wild animals and so on and so forth. And this is an imagery and uh, sort of stereotyping that uh, is found throughout. Now, I'm not trying to uh, whitewash the, the reputation of yeah. uh, you know, steppe peoples. They were pretty brutal people, right. like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. uh, and especially when they had military success, of course. Yeah. Uh, any conqueror is going to be brutal to uh, you know, enact their conquest. Mm -hmm. But um, if you look at uh, the, the wars that are waged between the Huns and the, the Romans, uh, in the West. We have pretty good records of why these wars break out. And they always happen when, from the, the Hunnic perspective, mm -hmm. the, the Romans break treaties. Right. So uh, the Attila constantly claims and berates uh, the Roman ambassadors 
uh, on uh, on the, the Roman emperor breaking his uh, his oath and breaking his promises that he had made in his last treaty with the Huns. Mm-hmm. So uh, there were th- specifically three obligations that uh, the Roman emperor had to meet for peace. One was to pay tribute, obviously, which they <laughs> did or did not pay, according to uh, the Huns. Secondly, they were not to receive fugitives from Hunnic territory into their domain. If anybody flees from the Huns to the Romans, then they were to be handed back, especially high-ranking defectors, right. yeah. like princes and rebels and people like that. And of course, the, the Huns would re, re, you know, return the favor sometimes and return Roman fugitives mm-hmm. uh, to, um, uh, to the Romans. There were sort of articles of uh, you know, the treaty which had to be respected. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, they're not allying with the, uh, the, the, the enemies of the Huns, right? So and that sort of thing. And of course, uh, the Romans frequently went behind the Huns' back and tried to either stir up revolt or ally with another tribe that was uh, or a group that was hostile to the Huns. And so uh, broken treaties uh, is the, uh, the, uh, the pretext for war. Um, right. And that's how they justify it. Uh, mm-hmm. But of course, uh, this is a pretext, right? As with all wars, yeah. uh, uh, of course, the strong uh, are always wage it uh, because it's beneficial for them, and or, mm-hmm. you know, um, and uh, the Huns, of course, waged war uh, for very different reasons. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, uh, in one case, uh, uh, there is this uh, story which is, sounds completely unbelievable. Uh, mm-hmm. The empress, uh, sorry, the, the, there was a sister of the the Western Roman Emperor called Honoria, mm-hmm. who uh, uh, supposedly had an affair and uh, was about to be punished by her brother. And uh, in order to escape the situation, she, pro- she supposedly proposed marriage uh, to Attila the Hun. And so Attila used that as a pretext to claim half of the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire, as her dowry. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so that was the invasion pretext, right? right. So, or according to the Romans, anyway. Right? Yeah. Whether that really was the pretext or not, who knows. But um, so there's always a reason. Even Genghis Khan, when he wages war, if you look at it carefully, he always has a reason. And he always is right from the 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 iteration perspective or the the Mongol perspective. Yeah. He's all he's always been a, he's always the aggrieved party. Usually, his ambassador has been murdered or something like this. Right? So somebody refused to send troops and tribute that they had promised. So there is a broken promise, or there is an outrage committed against the ambassadors. That's the usual pretext. And now, from the the Chinese perspective, of course, uh, the Chinese would also feel aggrieved because look. You promised not to wage war on us, and yet there are raiding parties that right. swoop in immediately after the treaty is signed. What about these people? Right. Uh, and, and now the, the response that would come from uh, the, uh, the Xiongnu or the, the Mongols would be that these people are not controlled by the central government. Right? These are just independent bands that are operating outside of our jurisdiction. Mm. So you deal with them. It's not our responsibility. Yeah. But that is a lie, of course, <laughs> right. because uh, these groups are not, yes, they are autonomous, they are deliberately left autonomous. Usually, no, uh, these iteration empires like to uh, place a sort of a cushion of semi-autonomous bands yeah. and tribal groups between themselves and, uh, and a powerful mm-hmm. sedentary empire. Yeah. And so what these groups would do is they would uh, make probing expeditions into this, uh, this territory to test out its defenses to see how dangerous they are. And if they react very violently and very powerfully, then yeah. no, no, we just reject all association with them and say this is, has nothing to do with us. And so that prevents uh, the danger from being uh, sort of uh, inflicted on the, the main you know, sort of uh, imperial body. But if the, the probing attacks show that these people are vulnerable, then it's the, it's, that leads to a full-out invasion later um, with some made-up pretext, right, so, to justify uh, the invasion. Uh, but uh, when imperial powers, you know, uh, I mean, look at the Romans, right? right. They, they're, they're invading everybody. Mm. And yet always, if you look at Roman history, there is a reason why wars happen. Right. Yeah. And it's always, a ca- it's always the case that the Romans are justified in mm. carrying out whatever right. <laughs> plundering invasion that they uh, decide to start, right? So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, um, it's kind of pointless to sort of uh, say who who was right and who was wrong, and uh, who who was the the uh, you know the the, um, the the guilty party and who was the righteous party. As with all events in history, any kind of a war usually uh, has multiple causes, and um, 
In, in most cases, uh, it's shades of gray, a lot of gray rather than black and white. And uh, so in some cases, of course, uh, but of course, as I would always say, look at who's winning and you'll <laughs> see who's responsible. <laughs> if the winning party is the, that particular group, then they're probably the ones who, who caused the war, right? So, uh, because of course, why if they didn't have an advantage, why would they start a war, right? And uh, I suppose the reason why the uh, the innovation step empires re- appear so predatory mm-hmm. is because they were militarily superior most of the right. time. So that meant that uh, they, could, they could take advantage of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> their neighbors. And, um, and of course, uh, because it's such a martial society, any ruler who wanted to rule, uh, to govern his territories in a stable fashion had to prove right. that he had the, the, the step version of the, the mandate of heaven, mm-hmm. which is of course, uh, uh, the Turks call it kut, right? divine charisma. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, in order to prove that, you needed to win wars. Right? So, so um, these wars are waged not just to plunder and gather booty. It's meant to prove to one's subjects that uh, this ruler means business, that he is not somebody to be crossed and that his authority should be respected. So therein lies part of the explanation for the belligerence of these kings. They need, they need wars to invalidate their positions. And um, I suppose that's not uh, you know, just uh, limited to yeah. uh, steppe peoples. If you look at uh, medieval Europe, that's mm-hmm. what they do all the time. Yeah. You know, the king is supposed to be a war leader and uh, he's yeah. meant to win wars. Mm-hmm. So the wars are the sport of kings, right? That's uh, yeah. a saying that uh, was very prevalent in uh, Western Europe um, mm-hmm. uh, until the 19th century. <laughs> and beyond, yeah. As many of the steppe peoples were pastoralists, they had a diet richer in dairy and meat protein. So I asked if their high-protein diet led them to become better warriors than their sedentary counterparts who had mostly carb-based diet. I mean, I, I haven't been to Mongolia myself, but mm. my brother has been. And he told me that he was surprised by the good physique of the Mongols that he mm. met, right? So that yeah. he expected them to be very short and stocky and what have mm. you, but uh, uh, they were actually quite, you know, physically strong for mm. obvious reasons, right? Uh, they live in a very harsh climate and uh, the climate and also the their diet uh, mm-hmm. would make them, well, not necessarily the, the healthiest people, but certainly physically fit, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, um, but I think uh, if you look at uh, the, the wars that are waged between uh, these uh, steppe peoples and mm-hmm. uh, uh, more sedentary empires. Mm-hmm. Um, what really gives them the the edge is their tactics and their mode of warfare. Mm-hmm. So their uh, abilities as horsemen, and also mm-hmm. which allows them to maneuver very quickly and to cover vast distances, um, and also their proficiency with the the, the bow uh, is something that uh, allows them to hit their targets from afar. Right. So time and again, what what happens is is that. Uh, the, the sedentary cavalry or the, the sedentary infantry that is fighting these steppe uh, mm-hmm. armies tries to engage in close quarter and they're never given uh, that, uh, well, they're rarely given that opportunity to actually directly engage uh, with, the, with the steppe horsemen because they just retreat and then, you know, do the Parthian charge, right? So, mm-hmm. And um, the, the power of the, the, the reflex composite bow uh, that uh, uh, the steppe uh, uh, horsemen perfected uh, that was a game changer, right? So in other words, uh, the, the steps is far from a military backwater in terms of technology. They actually had very advanced military technology for their time. And um, to give for give you an idea, uh, these step bows were capable of hitting targets 200 meters away and inflicting uh, mortal damage when in the hands of you know a very expert archer. In some cases, arrows could be, sh- could be shot 500 meters from mm-hmm. uh, uh, from the the place where the archer is, so uh, it's a tremendous weapon, and uh, this is being fired from horseback, right? right. As as the uh, in full gallop, so that is a particular lethal skill that uh, these people have perfected. Uh, and to put that in perspective, the you know the the English longbow, which supposedly did so much damage during the Hundred Years' War, which neutralized the best cavalry in Europe, the the French knight knights, uh, you know, in their heavy armor. Well, that was only effective. Uh, within a range of 100 meters. So just imagine a mobile army which has the capacity to hit targets twice uh, from twice as far away. Uh, this is just uh, the, the modern equivalent of the machine gun. And it's uh, the rate of fire that uh, these uh, uh, step uh, horsemen were capable of was just astonishing, right? They could fire um, 
I don't know. It's uh, I, I was given a particular figure by somebody who had mastered the technique uh, in Hungary, right. um, but uh, they they could fire literally thirty arrows per minute or something, Jeez. or even more. That's right. So it's just uh, just a constant barrage, yeah. and, uh, and so on the open plain, uh, uh, they were just invincible. You just couldn't stop them. Right. Um, the only way to beat them, of course, was to lure them into a terrain which was unsuitable for their horses. And uh, and then once they are uh, trapped in that terrain, of course, and had to engage uh, in close quarter combat, then of course they are vulnerable. But on the open plain, it's just uh, I, no army could really uh, expect to beat them, and especially when they're well organized and uh, well supplied. Right? And uh, and that is what, of course, the these imperial states, the the Shumlu Empire, the Mongol Empire, the Turkish empires were capable of. They had state apparatus which constantly supplied these troops uh, with reinforcements and uh, and uh, armaments right and so um this was a military machine that we're talking about it's not a random collection of you know um, barbarous you know primitive <laughs> tribes clad in fur which is what uh, people imagined them to be they were extraordinarily sophisticated military entre entrepreneurs let's put it that way yeah, yeah. While it is well known that the Huns and Xiongnu were great warriors, many forget that they are also prolific traders. What I and some of my Patreon supporters wanted to know is whether they also adopted some of the fashions and material goods of the people they conquer and vice versa. For example, the evolution of the Chinese pants were highly influenced by the steppe culture. Uh, these belts that uh, yeah. become very fashionable during the Tang Dynasty, they also mm -hmm. derive from the steppes, right? And the uh, uh, wearing of belts uh, decorated with uh, these particular sort of cloisonné style mm -hmm. uh, decorations uh, that are native to uh, Central Asia, mm -hmm. uh, they become very popular uh, during medieval times. And uh, mm -hmm. elites, uh, military elites in particular, from Western Europe to Northern China, they all adopt this because of the influence of uh, these steppe peoples uh, permeating all across Eurasia. Uh, now, in the case of the Xiongnu, of course, uh, uh, they're they're heavy, being heavily influenced by uh, the Western steppes too. So there is a lot of Scythian influence on uh, um, Xiongnu material culture, and we also see some, in, in, in fact, a lot of evidence of Chinese influence also on Xiongnu material culture. Did they actually wear, you know, the, use the silk for clothing? Now we know that the later Mongols used silk for practical purposes, right? So because uh, uh, they would wear the silk below their armor so that if uh, an arrow penetrated then uh, the wound, the, the silk would act uh, to prevent uh, the, the, the creating of a major wound uh, from this arrow penetrating. And so when you pull it out, uh, the silk acts as a, as a kind of a medium which prevents the, the, the skin from rupturing any further. Right? So there was a practical purpose yeah. in putting this below them. Um, now, whether the Xiongnu did anything like that, we have no way of knowing. Right. But uh, Sima Chen actually gives us a hint that uh, there is a Chinese defector who has to tell <laughs> the Xiongnu that the Chinese silks are useless. <laughs> yeah. you know, even if you wear them, you know, yeah. if you were to sort of, you know, sort of brush aside, you know, some brumbles and, you know, uh, yeah. you know um, uh, yeah, harsh terrain, uh, they would just rip immediately. So they're completely useless and you should stick to your own clothes made of fur. and. Uh, uh, you shouldn't wear the, these uh, Chinese, uh, you know, uh, uh, produced uh, you know, fabrics and what have you. Um, now that's, you know, kind of, there's a rhetorical purpose behind this as well, which, uh, so that cannot be used as evidence that the, the, the Shumanu elites were moving about dressed in, you know, Chinese clothes and Chinese silk. But uh, what is absolutely clear is that uh, uh, the, the Shumanu were trading Chinese silk. So they were acting as middlemen and they were sort of, they were receiving Chinese silk as tribute. And some of it they might have used for themselves, but most of it was being traded uh, to the West for enormous profit. So they were acting as middlemen. And uh, we, we tend to think of steppe peoples as these savage, <laughs> martial people who just keep on bashing people <laughs> and looting. But uh, they were businessmen, right? So they, they, they uh, the later, not just the, the Xiongnu, but uh, all later steppe empires mm -hmm. make it the top priority to protect merchants and uh, caravans mm -hmm. and to facilitate trade. Uh, and they're very interested in the economy. Money, of course, always yeah, right, yeah. is important to everybody, right? So, and these people cared about this. And so they, they did engage in a lot of trade. And uh, in a particular Xiongnu grave, we have discovered a fabric and rich sort of textiles from as far away as Greco-Bactrian territories in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, so we've got uh, 
you know, this marvelous textile with a, with a person with blue eyes and <laughs> what have you. And clearly this is not a Xiongnu person. Um, <laughs> although there were some Xiongnu who probably yeah. had, had sort of Caucasian features as well. But uh, this is definitely, if you look at the clothing, this is definitely not <laughs> somebody from you know, the East. It's somebody from uh, Western Eurasia. Right. But these sorts of things, of course, show up in elite burials because, of mm -hmm. course, that must have been something that uh, that particular Xiongnu aristocrat particularly fancied, right? And so mm -hmm. they buried this with it. Right. Um, but um, so trade was very uh, uh, developed, and uh, yes, they certainly did uh, were heavily influenced by outsiders, and uh, they, of course, impacted on uh, on uh, surrounding cultures as well. So mm -hmm. it was a process of acculturation. And again, I think uh, it's erroneous to think of these cultures as existing in splendid isolation. They never do. And so they're constantly developing via interaction with other people around them. And uh, I think um, the steppe empires were certainly no exception. And they had no particular prejudice towards anything, So, as far as we can tell. And so whether it be religion or uh, clothing or any kind of other material, which if they regarded it to be useful, these are practical people. So. Um, if it's useful, then by all means, <laughs> use it. Um, they didn't really seem to care. In Professor Hyun Jin Kim's book, he suggested that the Han political culture influenced the European political culture. So I asked him what exactly he meant by that. When I wrote my book, all right. everything in it, other than a couple of things, was, uh, was accepted by academia in general. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the two things that uh, um, some people criticized was uh, specifically when I suggested that uh, the arrival of the Huns was the most crucial factor in the, the redrawing of the political map of Western Eurasia. As I saw it, uh, if you look at it from a Eurasian perspective, um, this is not an accident, right? And of course, the fall of the Roman Empire has various uh, causes behind it. But um, if you were to name one principal cause for all the complete mess that <laughs> <laughs> envelops the Western Roman Empire in particular, and also much of the Eastern Empire, it is the Huns causing havoc and creating their own empire on right. Rome's doorstep, which is causing all of this territorial uh, changes to, to, to occur. Uh, that is something that uh, Western historians uh, find difficult to stomach because uh, they cannot uh, accept the fact that the Romans were militarily outclassed. That's something that uh, they refuse to accept. Uh, they think that uh, anything that comes from the East must be primitive. Uh, that's prejudice, of course. It's it's not based on sound uh, um, archaeology or uh, um, actual material culture or uh, you know, uh, remains. Uh, yes, the Romans were brilliant. Uh, certainly, you know, were better at building cities and uh, urban architecture and that sort of thing. Uh, but when it comes to military technology, as I've just uh, you know, outlined, uh, steppe peoples were superior, uh, and um, and this is reflected in the fact that the, the Romans themselves, later in their war manuals, the Strategicon in particular, they basically take over all of these nomad tactics and military hardware and uh, just adapt. Right? They just copy wholesale uh, Hunnic and Avar practices. So there is you know, ample proof that uh, the Romans were just outclassed, but uh, scholarship just doesn't want to accept that. But uh, that'll come you know, uh, in time. But uh, so that's okay. That's uh, people ask. We'll, we'll sort of learn. The more research that is coming out is actually proving that to be the case. Right. But um, the one aspect which uh, people found most, uh, you know, difficult to stomach or controversial was this idea that uh, medieval feudalism uh, was in influenced by Central Asian and Inner Asian feudalism or quasi feudalism. Now, the uh, I think it's it's a no-brainer because. Uh, Quasi-feudal or proto-feudal uh, societies existed in Inner Asia thousands of years prior to its first uh, inception in medieval Europe. So European feudalism begins with the Franks, and the Franks were conquered and ruled by the Huns. And so these Germanic peoples who start the, the process of feudalizing Europe, uh, they're clearly, their material culture is also very, very heavily influenced by the Huns and Danubian, uh, you know, Hunnic culture. So, um, I think, and in fact, even Frankish uh, his, histories themselves talk about how the Franks and the Turks, by Turks they mean the Huns, uh, were related and in one people, and that uh, uh, they actually derive from this Eastern, or they have this Eastern origin, uh, which is, you know, an exaggeration, but uh, you get the idea, right? So they, they were harking back to uh, uh, these, uh, these Eastern origins. And so uh, I think there is ample evidence to prove this, but uh, uh, some people have argued that uh, 
No, actually, uh, in medieval feudalism derives from uh, the Roman practice of partitioning the empire amongst the, uh, uh, well, the, the tetrarchy, for example, right? So that Diocletian, it dividing the empire into four pieces. Uh, that's where it comes from. But that's really difficult to believe because, A, the, the experiment didn't last very long. And uh, how would uh, Germanic peoples in the fifth century have any knowledge of something that happened at the beginning of the fourth century in Rome, which just disappeared and was never practiced again, right? So, and uh, the thing is, uh, the division of fiefs uh, in the Frankish uh, Empire uh, is completely identical to the sort of thing that happens in the Hunnic Empire and other steppe uh, polities, but it does not resemble at all the territorial divisions the administrative divisions that happen in the Roman Empire. So there are characteristics of this uh, part of these partitions that uh, clearly suggest that it's from the east rather than from the south. Uh, so I strongly do believe uh, that uh, uh, there is a Hunnic influence on the Franks and that that is the, the origin of medieval European feudalism. But again, as always, I think uh, people are resistant to the idea that uh, uh, Anything good could possibly, or anything sophisticated could possibly come from, uh, you know, from Asia or, you know, inner Asia at that, right? So if it was from China, maybe they would say, hmm, perhaps, you know, but uh, if it's from Central Asia or inner Asia, they would say, well, there's nothing there except folk-led savages. So surely nothing good could, could, uh, could come from there or anything sophisticated. Uh, but uh, the archaeology suggests otherwise. I would also like to remind everyone that technology does not only mean devices. Technology can also mean methods of organization, logistics, and tactics. In political and military terms, mm. uh, these inter Asian empires were incredibly sophisticated in their organization. So, right. uh, and th th that's my central argument. It's not because of some wonder weapon that they won their wars. It's because they were very, very well uh, organized militarily and politically. And that's what allowed them to create this massive empire. I mean, how do you put together an empire that's the size of the, the whole of the European continent and keep it going, even for what, 20 or 30 years, right? Uh, and of course, in, in usually these steppe empires last uh, way longer than that, right? So um, they had to have uh, advanced political organization, which we have evidence for. And, uh, and what happens when that organization comes into contact with other peoples? And they see that it is effective, of course, unless uh, that person is an idiot, so they would adapt measures that are successful right, for their own use. And that's exactly what the Germanic peoples did. And they didn't just copy, of course, they modified it and developed it further. Right? And so, um, so I'm not suggesting at all that European later sort of later medi medi medieval feudalism is identical with uh, what Xiongnu type quasi feudalism. So they, they've evolved into uh, separate things. But um, uh, I think the impetus for, for that so transformation from a unifying, centralized Roman Empire uh, to this highly, uh, still centralized but feudal system of governance that you find in uh, medieval Europe has to be the legacy of, uh, of the Germanic peoples coming into contact with a uh, very highly organized um, uh, you know, uh, steppe peoples, uh, of course, uh, the, the Huns and the Avars. Now, here comes the last question. Since the latest research in academia could take decades to trickle down to the public consciousness, I asked Professor Kim what are some of the latest discoveries or established consensus that the general public should know? Uh, I think a lot, actually. But uh, amongst academics, amongst mm -hmm. academics, there is now a wide consensus, for example, that uh, the Xiongnu and the Huns are the same. Mm -hmm. right? uh, not in the sense that uh, they're ethnically or genetically the same, in the sense that uh, uh, they refer to the same name and that uh, uh, the, what, for whatever reason, these peoples harked back to that imperial tradition. I think no scholar who seriously researches uh, Central Asia, Inner Asia, and Iranian history, or, uh, they would say that, uh, you know, these people have nothing to do with the Shunmu or something like that, right? So everybody is now in agreement that, uh, yes, there is something to, something between the Shunmu and the, and the Huns. Uh, so that is something that I think people are unaware of. Uh, people still think that there is this huge debate. There isn't. <laughs> Most academics now agree that the, the Huns are Xiongnu, but not in the way that people think they are, right? See, yeah. see, so it's not a... There is some, probably, you know, blood connections here and there, but uh, on, on the elite level. But uh, obviously, the European Hunnic Empire is a different political entity from you know, the, the Hun Xiongnu Empire in the East. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, the, the Hunnic Empire in Central Asia is also, again, different. 
from either of them, right? Uh, but um, but still, I think uh, uh, scholarship has 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 I think developed a more nuanced appreciation of what this connection is, and uh, there is an overall consensus which has been reached, which is basically uh, which cannot be overturned <laughs> because the all the evidence points in that direction. Uh, so that's it's it's a it's a done deal, and yet. Um, I think uh, if you if you read uh, ancient historians uh, who study just the Greek and Roman uh, textual sources, they keep on repeating this uh, mantra uh, that uh, oh there is debate about whether the Shungnu are connected to the Hans or not, um, and that is because they just don't read. Uh, that, that's very uh, that's very uh, disappointing because a lot of this literature is actually in English right. and in other Western languages, so there's no excuse for not reading them if it was in Chinese or something. Okay, but uh, much of the most advanced research on this is in English, and so they just don't bother to read uh, books outside of their discipline area. Mm -hmm. But if they're going to write about the Huns, or mm -hmm. if they're going to write about the fall of the Roman Empire, which involves in incursions from the East, surely they should. They have to read. Right? Mm -hmm. It's it's just not uh, viable to do otherwise. So that is something that uh, you know. I think uh, the general public should be aware of that uh, the, the, the the discussion no longer exists in, in practice. It's amongst academics who are experts in the field. Uh, it's just a, a leftover residue of uh, of discussions that uh, were being held in the 1970s or something, <laughs> which people keep on reading for whatever reason. They don't bother to read a more recent literature, which is which is baffling. But um, but laziness is 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 the um, is the reason for that, and that'll that'll pass, right? But it's taking a taking a while. Uh, another thing would be that um, I think uh, it's high time that we drop the name, the the notion nomad, uh, from uh, uh, from the description of uh, these steppe peoples. They're not nomads. Uh, they they operate within a strictly confined territorial space. Uh, yes, some of them don't have uh, fixed dwellings. That's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, they operate, uh, you know, widely and uh, go all over the place or are free to go all over the place. If they cross over into somebody else's territory, there's going to be war, right? So um, this is not a power vacuum. So, so people look at the steps and think, oh, these vast open spaces, you know, you can just go anywhere you want, you're free. No, none of these people are free. In fact, uh, the residents of the steps uh, operated under very tight and strict organization and discipline. Otherwise, they just couldn't survive in that environment. So um, they are actually a very tightly organized, sophisticated group uh, in terms of organization, military and political. And uh, their material culture obviously is different because of their environment. Right? Right. So, but um, uh, they frequently, if, you, if you're talking about any kind of so-called nomadic empire, uh, the vast majority of the population was not nomadic. Right? Huh. <laughs> So yes, some people practice pastoralism within that empire, but uh, you cannot have an imperial state which consists of just one mode of production, right? So, so there, there is this old sort of uh, you know misunderstanding that uh, uh, steppe empires are parasitic. This is uh, Barfield's famous idea that uh, oh, what triggered the the creation of the the Shungdo Empire was the unification of China, right? So the China unified, so the steppe peoples thought that they had to unify too to sort of face off against China. And that the uh, these constant wars were waged because the the steppe empire could not uh, exist by itself. It uh, couldn't produce foodstuffs and stuff. <laughs> they couldn't feed its own people, so they had to constantly raid uh, to get the the produce that they needed from uh, the Han Empire. Right. So, um, in other words, uh, the, the steppe empire is a parasitical state which cannot exist by itself. Again, complete nonsense, right? So they had agricultural bases and uh, they were self-sufficient, right? And so wars that were waged by uh, the Shungnu against the Han was not to <laughs> to loot uh, foodstuff you know, with, with which to feed their people. It was meant for prestige. It enhanced the the authority of the emperor. who was, uh, And it prevented his uh, outlying territories from going over to the other side by constantly demonstrating that uh, they had military superiority. So uh, that's something that I think uh, the general public also should be aware of, that uh, uh, the steppe empires are just that, they're empires. They're not, uh, you know, rudimentary, you know, some tribal confederation or something which just develops and then 
evaporates at the drop of a hat. So, I mean, the Xiongnu Empire lasted for four centuries. That is a hell of a long time, right? So, um, I think that's something that uh, people should be aware of. Anyway, if you like this kind of cool history, then subscribe because we've got plenty more to come. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook too if you feel like reading some of my musings. And before I go, I would like to thank all my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible. If you want to see the raw interview, you can access it by becoming a patron. Until next time, stay cool my bros!